Hello, this is Dylan Moore with Irita TV. Today is Tuesday, December 7th, 2021, and we are going to be talking about some heavy material today. I have Michael Sullivan here, who's a biblical author and or a biblical researcher and author, and we're going to be talking some rapture, some end of the world, some te- second coming of Christ, and you know, all stuff that I'm sure you've heard about before, but you probably haven't heard about the interpretation that we're going to be talking about today. And so before I get started, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, you can follow us on a variety of platforms. If you go to our website, irita.tv, uh, you'll find up in the top corner, uh, we're still on all the uh, old mainstream tech. We're, we're starting to get censored, but we're still up there. So you can follow some of our stuff there that doesn't get censored. And we're on all sorts of different various new tech platforms. Uh, I don't think we're on all of them, but we're on a lot. And more than likely, the one that you like, we're on. So feel free to follow us there. So, Michael, I super appreciate you coming on to talk about this incredibly important topic that uh, is has a personal relationship to me as well, and um, I think has a personal relationship to a lot of the people who are going to be listening to this. So, first and foremost, thank you for thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. It's a great opportunity. Yes. So, can you tell us a little bit about your background in this area? Sure. Um, the Lord saved me when I was about 18, and shortly thereafter, I went to Bible college. I went to Calvary Chapel Bible College, which is affiliated with Pastor Chuck Smith, the Calvary Chapel kind of denomination, although they're not, they don't want to consider themselves a denomination. But I graduated and got a degree in theology, and then I also went to the Master's College, affiliated with Pastor John MacArthur, uh, majored in theology for a year there, but then I, I came across this particular interpretation of Bible prophecy, and I didn't want to spend thousands of dollars on a theological education I disagreed with. So at that point, I dropped out and, and have just been reading and researching and writing and debating ever since. Excellent. And I also have, a, uh, I have two, two websites. One is fullpreterism.com, and the other one is treeoflifeministries.info. And I have authored two books. Uh, The first was a co-authored book. It's entitled House Divided, Bridging the Gap in Reformed Eschatology. It was a response to um, a reformed critique of preterism. And it's kind of a a debate book. And then my new book is Armageddon Deception, um, where I critique the eschatology of Islam and also Zionism. Talmudic Zionism, and even evangelical Zionism, which is what we'll be talking about, you know, premillennial dispensational rapture theology. And then I am going to be doing my best to translate all those fancy scholarly words that you're saying. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Michael did send me his books, and I've been reading through them, and and I don't think I'm a dumb guy, but I've, I've had to read through them a little slowly because there's, there's a lot of new terms in there. <laughs> That I'm just I'm just not that familiar with yet. So um, part of part of this will be me working to translate the layman's terms for this because my 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 interaction with this world is from the layman's perspective, and I think most people um, have that interaction with it as well. So first and foremost, the reason the reason that we wanted to get you on was because the end is nigh, right? Or is it? We're 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 having more people say, okay, the the, the rapture's on its way. Get ready, and I, I wanted to get your feedback on that and the history of of that claim. Right. Well, the the church has historically always had issues with this. Um, even in, during the Crusades. You know, the Muslims were identified with different figures in the book of Revelation. Um, You know, the Muslim world was the beast or whatever. And then you get into the Reformation period. And then the reformers are saying, no, the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church, they're the beast. They're the great harlot of Revelation. Um, And we've had a history of always predicting the end. The end was near and the end never came. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a different perspective uh, that most of your listeners have not heard. And let me quickly back up. 
when you debate and I've, I've debated um, a charismatic and I'm hoping to line up a debate with a Muslim and uh, a rabbi, but when you do interact with Muslims, rabbis, and those liberal theologians that are skeptic of the Bible, they always say this, well, Jesus promised that his second coming would take place in his generation, Matthew 24, uh, verse 34, in the lifetime of those standing next to him, Matthew 16, 27, 28. And the New Testament writers are consistent with that and teach that the second coming was soon quickly in hand in their generation. So the end of the world didn't happen in that generation and the New Testament authors can't be inspired because they were wrong. And the, the historical church has had a really hard time dealing with New Testament eminence. And uh, I'm going to prove that Jesus never predicted the end of world history. He predicted the end of an age. And that end of the age that he's discussing is the end of the old covenant age. And that did end within his generation. So we'll unpack that a little bit more when we get into the Olivet Discourse. But you're right. I mean, I'm talking to you previously, you know, what your grandfather shared with you is pretty much kind of the mentality I went through. You know, after the Lord saved me at 18, I was going to Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, California. And every New Year's, we had a prophecy update where basically he yep. would read Matthew 24. He would read the book of Revelation and he would just fill in the contemporary news with, with that. And I had just been trained at a Bible college and I was like, wow, he's not doing any exegesis here. He's just doing what I call newspaper and, eschatology. And then, just okay, reading we, current we, events we got two big words here. What's exegesis? <laughs> exegesis is when you're interpreting scripture with a grammatical historical hermeneutic, you're asking the questions, who, what, when, where, you're you're studying various Greek words, how they're used. You're looking at the context. You're pulling the meaning of the passage uh, out from the passage instead of eisegesis, which is the opposite. You're reading something into the passage, and then you're interpreting it that right. way. Well, and then I'm, so I'm, that's what they were doing. I'm this. reading a, a modern translation in English, and they use this word in English, which compares to this word that I saw in the news, so therefore they're connected. That sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or and we'll get into this later, like the gospel must be preached in all the world. Well, that Greek words, oikimene, how we use world and how they use world might be a little different. And, and we'll get into that. Right. A little bit and as then well. the word eschatology, but, you know, this, this whole concept of eschatology just means the study of end times or of Bible prophecy. That's Got it. All it is. The I, study of last things. And I interrupted you. Please continue. Oh, no. Well, you know, after after I was saved and and went to Bible college and returned back to Calvary Chapel, you know, and I was trained how to study scripture, I started seeing clearly that my pastor was taking newspaper headlines and then reading them into the Olivet Discourse and the Book of Revelation. And, you know, like wars and rumors of wars, the whole message would be what was going on in Russia. And it's like, well, you know, Jesus says it's going to take place in his generation. So how does that then he would say, no, it's our generation. So there's definitely differences, and we'll go through that. But the mentality I was, I was taught, and you were taught, was that the rapture could happen at any minute. And therefore, I, you know, I was like 20 at this time, and I was like, I wanted to get married. You know, I wanted to go to college more. And it's like, man, I'm not going to have time to do any of this stuff. I'm going to miss out on a lot in my life. Because well, and it's not just you thinking that. Moment. You were told you know? that, right? Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Chuck Smith absolutely said that because the whole the, he was following Hal Lindsey, you know, the late great planet Earth, um, where in 1948, uh, Israel became a nation. That's the super sign. And so a generation from that was like 1988. And, you know, so the rapture was supposed to happen somewhere in that time frame. Of course, it didn't because they changed the meaning of this generation. And, and we'll address that later on. But, you know, how is that used elsewhere in the Gospels? It's not referring to any other generation except for Jesus's contemporary generation. So these were things that I learned in Bible college. And Bible college taught me how to study hermeneutics, um, which is just a big word that means the science of interpretation and exegesis, which I 
you know, discussed as well. So just kind of studying on my own and then reading various books, I came to this position called preterism, uh, which makes a lot more sense and deals with Bible skeptics a lot better. And I think that your listeners and viewers, once they see me on pack this they'll begin to say hey that that makes a lot of sense now you have a lot of questions like i did but over time they're very easily answered yes well and then i also want to touch on something that you just brought up about we don't have time to do anything because the ramp is right around the corner and this was right. this is right. really the thing that 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 gets me about this and and for me, the prime driver why I wanted to have you on to talk about this is that there's a very massive ramification of this. I'll, I'll just call it rapture theory. I know that includes several different theories, but for the sake of, of easiness here, rapture theory is that because the rapture is going to happen at any second, you don't have time to get married. Don't go to school. You don't have time to get a job. Don't even bother taking care of yourself because that's a waste of time when you sh- when you should be getting your, your spiritual house in order. Don't do any of that. And that completely takes you out of of the world. You're, you're, you're not participating yes. in, in any part of the world. And you're, I mean, what occurred to me is that you're also not fighting evil. Right. 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 Which we'll, 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 get in, gets, we'll get into that more, I'm sure. Yes. You know, dispensationalism, uh, this, this predominant view right now in the mega churches and the, and the woke, You know, the TV evangelists, they're all from this perspective, most of them. And the mentality is you don't polish brass on a sinking ship. Things are supposed to get worse. And then Jesus is going to come and he's going to take us out when right before it gets super bad. So why get involved in politics? Why try and change anything? Why and why try and develop a long term strategy to fight, say, the New World Order, Klaus Schwab? Um, you know, all these guys, these globalists, why do that when everything's supposed to get worse? And then we get out of here. So that theology is heretical, I believe. And it has real, I would say it's satanic, you know, real time in life application problems. Yeah. That, that really affects the here and now Mm -hmm. how we live. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't mind, I wanted to. You mentioned my grandfather's story. I should probably tell it so everybody else can <laughs> can hear yeah. it because th- th- this is this is where my personal uh, interaction to this story came from. So my my grandfather died when I was twenty seven, and uh, his wife died when I was seventeen. And once my grandmother died, he he was just like, "It's any time now that I'm going. But, you know, could be tomorrow. I'm going to die. I'm I'm out of here." And it took him 10 years of treating himself like absolute garbage to finally kick the bucket. And in those 10 years, when I'd go to visit him, the, the favorite thing that he wanted to talk about was this rapture story. And it, uh, I, I only, only remember pieces of it, right? But it, it was stuff like, you know, there's going to be this Antichrist who, who's, who's going to be this world leader that's going to bring in seven years of peace, that's going to be followed by seven years of war, and at some point... Um, the, the whole Armageddon thing's going to cu- cu- um, uh, jump off when Damascus gets hit with a nuclear bomb, and then Russia and China are going to go into war, and then the United States is going to is going to uh, not exist because it's not mentioned anywhere in the Bible anymore. And this is proved by the fact that uh, they mention the Bible mentions or Revelations mentions a, a river running dry and 200 million people marching over it. Well, China now has the ability to dam up the the Yellow River or whichever one it is, and they've got 200 million people and they can march over it. So that that proves this this aspect, right? And I remember I, I went over there one day, and he always had the news on, which we know is, is just a, a, bunch of, a bunch of garbage. And he, he's got the news on, and some explosion had happened in Damascus, that, like the, the day before or something, right? And so there's this big explosion in Damascus. It's literally on the screen when I, when I walk into the house, and he's going, it's happening right now! It's happening right now! And I'm like, no, it's not happening right now. <laughs> Like, th- th- right, this right. is an area that's been, that's been in war for like 5,000 years. Uh, an explosion in this area is not anything. It, it, anyway, so that was the feeling he, he right. came across to me, too, was why bother going to college? Why bother doing anything when this, this stuff's right around the corner? And it's devastated the church. I mean, we're, we're already considered the sleeping giant, right? Right. And it, it's bad enough when you're asleep at, 
And on top of that, you have really bad theology that just keeps you asleep. And that's, that's my goal. And that was the purpose of writing the book that I did. And that is, you know, Islam is always trying to self-fulfill this battle of Armageddon and Gog and Magog. Israel is trying to constantly do that. So they're picking fights. And then we have all these dispensational evangelical Christians um, that love the Lord. I, I, I believe they do, just like I did when I held that position. But they constantly want to see this war in the Middle East so that they can get raptured. So between the three of them, it's this constant circle of conflict in the Middle East because they want this war to usher in their Messiah or their version of the second. And then coming. they personally get I to do be is saved. I show how Christ. Right. And yeah. destroy the other groups. Right. Right. God's going to destroy the other groups. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So it, it, it's a circular conflict that needs to be broken. And I believe the view that I hold to breaks it very well. That's excellent. Now, by but, showing that the coming of the Son of Man and that war was between AD 67 and 70 when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem and uh, and destroyed her. Before we get into that, so, uh, and then mm-hmm. just quickly on terms. So we've got um, preterism, which is what you're going to tell us about here soon. And then we've got dispensationalism, yes. which is the rapture, right. rapture club, right? Can you right. tell us exactly. the bullet points of the rapture? I mean, at the very least for me, because all I'm going off of is the bits and pieces that I remember from my grandfather. And I may have even told them the wrong because it's been so long since I heard them. Can you go over the the story of what's supposed to happen according to the dispensationalists so we can break it down. Um, The main distinctives, and I guess I'll start with the one that you just mentioned, the rapture. So John Nelson Darby is pretty much the father of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism has only been around for maybe 150 years or so, but a lot of Christians in these big mega churches that are dispensational today really wouldn't know what the church has believed Prior to that, they think that this rapture theology is what the church has always believed, and that's just not the case. What's new about the rapture dispensational teaching is that they believe that there is a secret rapture that takes place seven years before the second coming, and the church has never taught that prior to Darby, all right? The church either believed that there was a spiritual coming in AD 70, and that there will be a second coming in the future to us, or that's called partial preterism, or the amillennial view, which was the, the predominant view and held by the Catholics and most of the reformers. And that view teaches, well, there's only one second coming. There's no secret rapture. It's just Christ comes. So the problem with the dispensational view and the partial preterist view is that they have two kind of second comings of Christ. And and the, and the scripture doesn't teach that. As far as other pillars, and the main pillar of dispensationalism is that it has a, what I call a hyper-literal hermeneutic. You got to remember that fundamentalism and evangelicalism was a pendulum swing and an extreme reaction to the liberal movement that took place in the 1800s. So the liberals were interpreting the Bible cutting it up and chopping it up and assigning, you know, different authors and everything. But they were interpreting the Old Testament, all these stories, these these historical events. They were saying, well, it's not really historical. These stories are just all myths. They didn't really happen, you know, denying archaeology and, and and the form of genre that it was written in. And then they would come to the New Testament and they would deny all the miracles of Jesus. They would spiritualize them all away. So the church wanted to react to that, but they reacted way over here and dispensationalism was formed where they, they interpret everything with this hyper literalism. And we don't want to interpret the Bible hyper literally. We want the literal meaning of the text. So if I'm reading apocalyptic language or I'm reading a vision, I'm not going to interpret it literally. I'm going to understand there's a lot of symbols in, in this particular genre that I'm reading. But with the dispensationalists, they interpret everything with this hyper-literalism. And that's that's the, the cornerstone, I think, and, and the chief problem with them. The other one is that they make this distinction between two peoples of God. You have Israel and you have the church, and there's this radical distinction between them. 
whereas the scripture doesn't give a radical distinction. Uh, um, you know, you have believers in the Old Testament that are in that have faith in the coming Messiah. And then once the Messiah comes, you have believers, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, believing in the Messiah and they're one body, they're one temple. And that's how the New Testament kind of uh, addresses that. But um, Dwight Pentecost says this, who's a dispensationalist, he says the church cannot be uh, presently fulfilling the new covenant. John Walvoord says the new covenant is with Israel and awaits the second coming of Christ for its fulfillment. And so dispensationalism, because they have this radical distinction between Israel and the church, they say Old Testament prophecies made to Israel cannot be fulfilled in the church. Well, that is a serious problem because the new covenant was made to Israel in the Old Testament. But Jesus says what in Luke twenty two twenty he says, Uh, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, the church is the blood-bought body of Christ. If you believe in Christ, you have to believe that he shed his blood and he rose again on the third day. That's the new covenant. So they automatically have a problem right away, right? Because Mm -hmm. this is a promise made to Israel, but the New Testament authors say that it's fulfilled in the church. That's what happens when you are interjecting a system of theology into the scriptures you you come up with these very absurd um absurd teachings uh you know paul says that he's an administrator of the new covenant and yet paul is what he's the apostle to the gentiles um so again new covenant promises old testament promises that were made given to israel are being fulfilled in the church so that's another pillar that is um just gross is gross error another pillar is that jesus allegedly offered a physical earthly kingdom to israel but because so many of them rejected jesus god decided to go with plan b and and have the church the church was never prophesied in the old testament according to these people and so god's kingdom plans kind of get put on hold until the second coming in our future. And then we have this literal thousand year millennial period where allegedly Gentiles from all around the world will come to Jerusalem, um, be circumcised, and then go to this other rebuilt temple and offer animal sacrifices, which is a total anathema. If you read the book of Hebrews, you read Galatians, you read Colossians. Yeah, that doesn't right? sound like Jesus what Paul once and for all talked about. Yeah. Yeah, But see, you can see the problem if you're interpreting the Old Testament and the New Testament with this hyper literalism, you know, and you read in Ezekiel, you know, this super large squared city that's a temple and people are coming to it and their sacrifices. But the New Testament says that our praises are a sacrifice, right? Um, The New Testament says that we're a priesthood, a royal priesthood. The New Testament teaches that we are the temple. And so what dispensationalists miss is how the Jesus and the New Testament authors interpret those Old Testament passages. Mm-hmm. Because they look at the Old, Test- Old Testament Israel and the kingdom as typological of what would come in the New Covenant, which is spiritual and, and deals with the heart. So I remember in in the master's college, I was doing a report on the kingdom of God. And this is where I first started my journey away from dispensational rapturism. I said, okay, I want to, I want to see where Jesus was offering a physical earthly kingdom. (laughs) I couldn't find one verse. I looked at dispensational authors. I couldn't find one verse either. Everywhere Jesus describes his kingdom. Actually in John chapter six, the Jews tried to make him the king. And he says, "I, I reject your understanding of an earthly kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world, he told Pilate. Jesus said in Luke 17, he says, um, when the Pharisees asked him about the kingdom of God, when it would come, he says, when the kingdom of God comes, you will not be able to say, see here or see there, for the kingdom of God is within, all right? And so the kingdom comes when Christ comes upon the clouds, and Jesus connects both of those events in Luke 21 to be fulfilled in his generation when the temple is destroyed. So that is when the kingdom 
was fulfilled. It's within his people. God's presence in his people is the kingdom. It's not this earthly thing where Jesus is sitting on a literal throne where you can see it and say, there it is. And exactly. Cause that's, that's exactly what Jesus said. And even Paul in second Corinthians, he says, our hope is not on things which can be seen, but those things which are unseen being very consistent with what Jesus says. You're not going to be able to say, see here, see there, because the kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It's not of this world. It's within you. So that was the first problem I began to see. It's like, okay, I've been taught this system, but when I'm looking at the scriptures, everywhere Jesus describes the temple with, with water, it's spiritual water. Bread, it's spiritual bread. Temple, it's a spiritual temple. He's the temple. We're the temple. So, the, the hyper literal hermeneutic on the kingdom was in, in all of its teaching. And then it was like, well, where in the New Testament does it say that the kingdom got postponed? And I looked for that verse. It, it's just not there. It's just these are necessities, uh, bullet points to their system that they have to say um, it's to kind of fill in the gaps. But there's no verses for them. Right. And then when does you say postponed. Sense? Yeah, it makes sense. When you say postponed, you're, you're meaning what, what, even though the the start of Book of Revelation say uh, you know these ha- these things are going to happen very soon, it's two thousand years later, and we got to f- think of a reason why it's two thousand years later when it said very soon. Exactly, exactly. So those would be kind of the main pillars of of dispensationalism. Well, and then hyper literal hermeneutic, a distinction. Yes. Um. Actually, please finish. I'll follow my uh, my and question after I'll, that. I'll go ahead and get into. Okay. All right. So let me just summarize the dispensationalism, mm-hmm. and then we'll get into preterism and imminence. All right. So the pillars of dispensationalism is this distinction between a rapture coming and the second coming, which is never taught in the church. Okay. Prior to dispensationalism, this this uh, distinction between Israel and the church which causes them to say, hey, promises made to Israel can't be fulfilled in the church because God has two different programs. Some of them, some of them like John Hagee, even says that modern Jews today don't need the gospel because God can save them through the law. And it's like, does this guy even read the Bible? How did you have a church of 10 million people when, I mean, Jesus, Jesus and, and the apostles were preaching to Jews for the first 30 years saying you need the gospel. There's no other name given about to men by which men can be saved except for the name of Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. You can't be saved apart from that. But anyway, so two peoples of God, hyper-literalism, the rapture, and, and this, this understanding of the kingdom that has to be earthly, it has to be physical when Jesus in the, in the New Testament never teaches that. So now we get into the pillars of Preterism, which is what I want to share with you and your audience. Preterism just means past fulfillment. So, you know, when we get into the book of Revelation or we get into the Olivet Discourse, um, which why don't we just go right into the Olivet Discourse? But before that, let me let me back up. Here's a distinction of preterism. When I come to the New Testament, I want to interpret scripture with scripture. So in the Old Testament, when God comes on the clouds, he comes through an army. He comes through the Assyrians. He comes through the Babylonians. All right. When the stars fall from heavens and there's decreation language, it's not literal. It's not talking about the planet or the physical stars. In the Old Testament, rulers of nations are stars. So If God is judging um, Egypt or Assyria or Babylon or even Jerusalem in the Old Testament, you'll hear that language, that decreation language, but it's talking about their rulers falling from their places of authority. But we read that language in uh, the way, you know, we understand stars. Oh, it's talking about, you know, the end of world history, but it's not. So in the Old Testament, when God comes upon the clouds, he's not physically seen. He's... It's not like, oh, there's Jehovah. He's riding on a little cloud. I can see him. No, they understood that language to mean he's coming in judgment through an army, number one. Number two, in the Old Testament, when God said that kind of a judgment was coming, and he said it was coming near, quickly, 
It was at hand. It would not be delayed. It was always fulfilled within the lifetime of the prophet and his contemporary audience, like 99% of the time. So when I come to the Olivet Discourse of the Book of Revelation, and Jesus is a prophet, he's not going to come up with some new method of communicating to, to Jews who have been accustomed to this kind of literature and teaching. He's not going to start using these same terms in diff, you know, in a hyper-literal way. So the preterist says, well, I want to interpret how Jesus is this, describing his coming and his generation with how the Old Testament is, is describing those kind of judgments. So that's number one. Apocalyptic language, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interpret it metaphorically and symbolically, just like the Old Testament does. Time text, I'm not going to interpret soon, quickly, at hand, will not be delayed as referring to things thousands and thousands of years away. If the Old Testament uses those phrases and those events were fulfilled in the lifetime of the prophet or their contemporary generation. So now I come to the New Testament and what is Jesus teaching? So let's let's briefly look at that. Let's go to Matthew 24. I'll bring it up. So yeah. in Matthew 24, uh, the main error I see most uh, eschatological systems, whether they're amillennial, uh, postmillennial, or dispensational, premillennial, uh, it starts with the question. Okay, we start out in, in Matthew 23 where Jesus predicts that the, the destruction of the temple will take place in his generation. And then the disciples and Jesus are walking. And then the disciples look at the temple and they say, hey, Lord, look what great manner of stones these are. In other words, look how beautiful the temple is, Jesus. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left upon another. And then they ask this question or questions that are connected together. They want to know, Lord, give us some signs can, you know, before you will come, the end of the age takes place and the temple is destroyed. Now, most of these future systems say, well, wait a second. The disciples were confused to connect the destruction of the temple with him coming on the clouds and the end of the age because they interpret the end of the age as the end of world history. They interpret Christ coming on the clouds as something taking place in the future to end world history and they admit that the destruction of the temple did take place in AD 70 but they separate those events where the disciples connected them now here's the point number one the text doesn't say the disciples are confused do you see that anywhere in there no now the old testament in Daniel 7 Daniel 9 Daniel 12 and Malachi 3 and 4 they connect the coming of the son of man in judgment with the burning of the temple or the destruction of the temple and the city. So the disciples knew their old Testament. They knew Jesus was promising that he would come in their lifetime and in their generation. And he just predicted that the temple would be destroyed in their generation in Matthew 23. So they want to know, give us some signs when this is going to take place. So, now, also, the end of the age, that is key to understanding the Olivet Discourse. The skeptic will say, hey, look, Jesus is promising that the end of world history, the end of the age, is going to take place in his generation. No. Let me ask you something, Dylan. What makes more sense? When the destruction of the temple that the disciples are looking at, would you connect that with the end of the old covenant age? Or would you connect that with the end of world history? <laughs> well, if you put it like that, I would have to say the end of world history. No, of course, the uh, the end of the age. And then quick the old, question. The old covenant age. Yeah, quick question. What's yes. what's the Greek word for age here? Aeon. Aeon. Yeah. And, now, and that's King being James, confused as the end, yes. end of world history. Yeah, as yeah. like cosmos or something. And, and the King James unfortunately translated it translates it the end of the world and some of your king james only people are like you know well that's inspired you know so it's the end of the world and they would interpret world as the globe but it's just the end of the age as most translations have it so the context determines what end of the age is in view here 
It's not the end of the new covenant age. The new covenant age hadn't even started. The end of the new covenant age has nothing to do with the destruction of the temple that they are looking at. But the end of the old covenant age and that entire old covenant system, when the temple fell in AD 70, that makes contextual sense. So that's where the preterist interpretation comes in here that I think is more contextual and, and fits better. And I also mentioned that the disciples had already been taught that the coming of the Son of Man upon the clouds would take place in their lifetime. So let me read you a couple passages. Matthew 10, verses 22 and 23 says this. You will be hated by everyone. And by you, he's talking about the disciples he's talking to right there, not you and me. He says, you will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end, the end of what? The end of the old covenant age of Daniel 9 and Daniel 12 will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Now, here's the key. Truly, I say to you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. That's the coming of the Son of Man upon the clouds of Daniel 7, 13. Now look at Matthew 16, 27, 28. This was huge for me. It says this, for the Son of Man is going to come. The Young's literal translation says is about to come in his father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Clearly, the second coming. Now look at the next verse. Truly, I say to you. Whenever Jesus uses that phrase, verily I say unto you, truly I say unto you, it always links what has gone before with what follows it. Okay, so look at verse 28. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, that is, you will not die, before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So verse 27, second coming. Verse 28, there are some of you standing here who will live to see this happen. So Matthew 10, Matthew 16, this is what the disciples are being taught. Then we come to Matthew 24, and as I will show you, he once again promises this. In verse 34 of Matthew 24, he says, truly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all of these things are fulfilled. Notice he doesn't say some of these things will be fulfilled in this generation. He says all of these things. And he, of course, that's his coming upon the clouds as well. So this is what the disciples were taught. So when they're asking these questions, they're not mistaken. They're just following what Jesus has already taught them. So as we go through the Olivet Discourse, you know, and this is what we were brought up with, right, Dylan? All of the signs, you know, oh, there was a war over here. There's a war over there. There was an earthquake over there. That means Jesus is coming soon. The yep. rapture is coming soon. Notice in Matthew 24, Jesus gives general signs that he says will not mark the end. These are general signs that were going to take place in the disciples' generation, but they would not mark the end. Now, there are two signs he gives that would mark the end, and that is the fulfillment of the great tribulation and the abomination of desolation. But let's go through briefly um, the general signs. He says that there's going to be false prophets and messiahs. See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. All right? So that's the first one. There will be false prophets. There will be false messiahs. Well, we know in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5 and Acts 13, that there was false messiahs. There were false prophets. Also, Judas of Galilee in Acts 5.37. Uh, Simon in Acts 8, just to name a few. Josephus names all kinds of false prophets. And what were these false prophets doing according to, to Josephus? They were saying once the Jews came into Jerusalem for the feasts. They traveled throughout the Roman Empire to come to Jerusalem for the feasts. They said, don't leave the city because God is going to deliver us from the Romans and he's going to set up an earthly kingdom. These were false prophets, but God used those false prophets because he was going to judge those that rejected his son and killed his apostle and were killing his apostles and prophets and the martyrs. So that's the role of the false prophets. They were a general sign that the disciples would be able to look at and say, yeah, you know, the, the end is coming. Now, there are other ones. There's famines and earthquakes. 
So let's go on here. And, and the problem with this is, is um, you know, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13 are all parallel accounts of the Olivet Discount, of the Olivet Discourse. So some of them are going to have different verses. So I won't be able to give you a verse per se for sure. all of them, or we'd be flipping all over the place. Um, but there, there are other general signs, uh, famines, uh, wars and rumors of wars. In the annals of Tatius, he records wars from AD 14 to the death of Nero in AD 68. There were disturbances in Germany, commotions in Africa, commotions in Thrace, insurrections in Gaul. Uh, the Roman Empire was coming apart. There was all kinds of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, it says that there would be earthquakes and famines. And in AD 40 to AD 60, there were pestilence in Babylon, Rome, where Jews and Gentiles suffered. Uh, another sign that Jesus gives, he says that people are going to, family members are going to put each other to death. And of course, um, the first century Christians brought be- were brought before kings. He says they would be brought before kings and rulers. And we see this in the book of Acts. You know, Paul and Silas are, are brought before Galileo, Felix, Agrippa, Festus. Um, etc. Now here, now we get out of the general signs. Even though these prophecy experts, these TV evangelists keep saying these signs mark the end, Jesus says they don't. But, but here are two signs that will. The gospel must be preached in all the world. Okay, now this is where futurists think that they have me over a, a barrel. They say, well, you <laughs> Yeah, good luck teaching that the gospel was preached in all the world before AD 70. Well, in my book, I have a a chart, a very helpful chart, um, where you can see that Paul uses every Greek word that Jesus does to describe the Great Commission. And he says that it was fulfilled. It had been accomplished. For example, Jesus here in Matthew 24, verse 14, says the gospel must be preached in all the world. That Greek word is oikimene. It's the same Greek word that's used in Acts when it says that um, uh, Caesar or or Herod taxed the whole world. Well, you know, Herod didn't tax the globe, but he taxed the Roman Empire, right? So that is how this Greek word is used. And Paul uses the same Greek word here for a world that Jesus does in Romans 10, 18. And he says this, but I say, Have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And that Greek word is oikimene. Paul traveled throughout the Roman Empire. So he preached the gospel throughout the then known world. And that is the same Greek word that Jesus uses. And he says that that sign has to be fulfilled within their generation. And Paul is saying it has been fulfilled. That's why Paul kept teaching the end is near, the coming of the Lord is at hand, and so forth. Um, Jesus says the gospel must be preached to all nations in Mark's account, Mark 13, 10. And, and Paul says, my gospel has been made manifest. And by the prophetic scriptures has been, that's past tense, it has been made known to all nations, Greek ethnos. Jesus uses ethnos. Paul uses ethnos. He says the gospel has been preached to all the nations. What nations? Not the nations of the globe, but the the nations that they knew of that the Roman uh, Empire had conquered. And again, Paul preached the gospel to all of those nations. Um, He says that uh, the gospel must be preached in all the world cosmos. And he says in Colossians 1, 5, and 6, he says, of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world cosmos. So again, every Greek word Jesus uses, Paul says the great commission had been fulfilled. And then in Colossians one twenty three, he uses the Greek word katissus, um, which is a fulfillment of Mark 16, 15. So the point is, is that that is a sign that was fulfilled in that generation. But people will say, well, what about the great commission today? And I would say the Great Commission today is Revelation twenty two seventeen, where uh, the author says the Spirit and the Bride say, "Come." And so these nations at the end of the Book of Revelations are coming into the New Jerusalem, which Paul says is the Church. In Galatians four, 
he says the old covenant is Jerusalem from below Jerusalem from above is the new covenant that's us and so that symbolic language of the gospel being preached in the new covenant age today so I digress a little bit but the point is that this sign was very much fulfilled um, in that generation and before AD 70 but yet you'll hear these TV preachers, oh, we have to go preach the gospel in Zimbabwe or in some dark corner of Africa just so we can usher in Jesus' the second coming. And it's like, dude, that, that, sign was, that sign was fulfilled. And then the last one. Now, remember, two specific signs that mark that the end was near. The end of the world history? No, the end of the old covenant age. The abomination that causes desolation. All right. And that would be Matthew 24, verse 15. And then Luke's version would be Luke 21, verse 22. But there's a difference. Luke is written to Gentiles, where Matthew's gospel is primarily written to Jews. So they describe the abomination of desolation differently, but it is the same event. Um, In Luke's account, the desolation is described as the Roman armies surrounding Jerusalem in the years of AD 66 to AD 70. The Jews considered their land as a holy place. So when the Romans, that would be an abomination to a Jew. If you see Gentile armies on your land, that's an abomination, number one. Number two, it wasn't just the temple that was referred to as a holy place. They considered the land of Israel as a holy place. So when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem in about AD 66, AD 70, or AD um, 67, that was an abomination to the Jew that would make Jerusalem and the temple desolate. And what does Jesus say? He says, when you see that sign, if your coat is in your house, don't go get it. Flee and go to the mountains, Right. So this tribulation, this great tribulation, is a, Luke says, is a wrath that was coming upon those Jews and upon that land, the land of Palestine. And it would be connected with when they saw the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem and that they were to flee. Now, we know historically this is what happened, Dylan. We know this from Eusebius. We know it from Josephus. We know it from others, is that. When the Romans surrounded Jerusalem, Jerusalem, they retreated for a period of time. When they retreated, the false prophets said, don't leave the city. God's going to deliver us from the Romans. But the Christians remembered what Jesus said about this sign, and they left the city, and they fled, and they went to Pella, and they were safe. So the Great Tribulation, these signs were all fulfilled, what? Because how does Jesus answer the disciples' question about the signs, the end of the age, him coming, and the destruction of the temple? When you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, you would know. When When the gospel of the Great Commission has been fulfilled, you will know. But verse 34, he answers their question by saying, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. Now, let's get into that, all right, because that is kind of the cornerstone to the Oliver Discourse, is what is meant by this generation? Now, some of these dispensationalists will say, oh, well, it's the race of Jews. This race of Jews will not go away until all these things are fulfilled. Well, there's a completely different Greek word. If Jesus wanted to say that and communicate that, he would have used genos, all right? But he doesn't. He he uses uh, genea. For, mm. for generation. And the other five places where this term, this generation is used, they always refer to Jesus's contemporary generation. For example, in Luke 17, he says, this generation will hand over the son of man and basically kill him, crucify him. Well, that's the only, you that's know, what if I told you, Dylan, Dylan, this just, this generation is going to see X, Y, and Z. You wouldn't be going, oh, Mike is talking about a generation thousands of years from now. Right. You would be you would be saying, well, he said he said this generation. He didn't say that generation and he didn't say, you know, any other generation except this one. 
And so that's the kind of gymnastics that some of these people have to do. Oh, well, it's really the race of Jews. No, he would have used a different Greek, uh, Greek word if that's what he wanted to communicate. Number two, it's never used in any other way as other than Jesus's contemporary generation. Another one is, well, Jesus is talking about the generation that will be alive to see these signs, right? And that's where you get kind of Hal Lindsey saying that, you know, Israel becoming a nation in 1948 was the super sign. You know, that was the fig tree coming, you know, budding out and so forth. But I just got done proving to you that Jesus's contemporary generation was the generation that saw all those signs. So that interpretation doesn't even work. And it's never used that way anywhere else in scripture. So then we get to Christ coming uh, in, in verse 27. He talks about him coming from the east to the west. Now, that Greek word, you don't have to translate that as lightning. In the Greek, it's just a bright light. So what bright light comes from the east and the west? Well, I would see that as the sun and sun shining flashing from the east and the west, not necessarily lightning. And I would connect that to Malachi 4.2, where it talks about the sun of righteousness will come with healing in his wings. But anyway... When the Romans came, they came swiftly and they came quickly. And and then in Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31, it talks about the son of man coming upon the clouds. It talks about the tribes of the land mourning. And again, if I'm reading the Old Testament and I see when God comes on the clouds, he's coming through armies. And I just got done reading in context Jesus is connecting this coming, his coming on the clouds with armies surrounding Jerusalem. If I'm a good Jew, I understand that language. I'm not expecting a five foot five Jew riding on a physical cloud someday. That's that's not how they thought. That's that's not the genre in which they were taught and the prophets used. That's how we think. And that's that's the problem Mm -hmm. that that's in essence, the real problem is that we not, we're not using a historical hermeneutic. We're not using words and phrases the way that culture used them. Does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. And I mean, it, go, it goes back to what I was saying yeah. when, you, when you mentioned uh, the preacher, I can't remember which one that you used to attend, that would say, okay, here, here's, here's the, the language of, of the end days, and here's the news. Let me put the news onto the language of the end days. Right. Right. Yeah, and you end up talking more about the news than what's actually what the text actually says. And, and that just drove me crazy. It's like you're supposed to be preaching the word. You're not supposed to be, you know, telling stories or telling me what's going on in Russia or the Gorbachev has this this mark, this birthmark on his head. And maybe you can see six, six, six. And just crazy <laughs> crap. I pardon my language, you know, that was just coming out of these people's mouths that had absolutely nothing to do with I got one to add to that. Jesus I, I was teaching. I just remembered. My mother said, we're going to see 666 in the gas prices. Oh, the gas prices. Okay. <laughs> well, do you want to get it? You, you want to get in? Uh, let's go ahead and go to Revelation. Sure. Because now here's the thing. I, I told you that the Olivet Discourse, you can find the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. You can find the Olivet Discourse in Mark 13. And you can find the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21. But we have one more gospel, the Gospel of John. Do you find the Olivet Discourse in the Gospel of John? No, you do not. Okay. John's version of Jesus' teaching in the Olivet Discourse is the book of Revelation. All right? I see. His version of the Olivet Discourse. It's 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 the same event with different metaphors, different symbols. And more expanded. And so... Exactly. So how do I know that my interpretation I just gave you of the Olive Discourse is correct? Well, how do the New Testament inspired authors, how did they understand Jesus' teaching? Well, Paul said that the gospel had been preached throughout the Roman world. Therefore, he was teaching that the second coming was at hand, near, soon, about to take place. Question, Dylan. Was Paul inspired? Didn't Jesus teach the disciples 
and the apostles. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will lead you into all truth concerning things to come. In other words, the Holy Spirit was specifically given to the New Testament writers to lead them into truth about eschatology, about Bible prophecy. So when John is saying it is the last hour, um, or Peter says uh, in 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. They're not giving you their opinion of what they, when they think Jesus is coming. They're inspired. And the liberal comes along and says, well, wait, you Christians keep saying scripture's inspired, but clearly they were wrong because the end of the world didn't happen. Ah, but we get back to the, the New Testament authors aren't predicting the end of world history. They're predicting the end of the old covenant age and that world system. So once we get into the book of Revelation, Dylan, most systems can't even get past the first verse. Let's go to the, the first, first verse then. is John. He, yeah, he's writing to seven churches in Asia Minor. Minor. He's not writing to you and me. Is there application in the book of Revelation for us? Sure. But we have to point out the clear and obvious thing here is that the book of Revelation was written to seven historical churches in Asia. And he says, I am writing to you about things which must shortly take place. He's not right. The book of Revelation is not about things that are going to be fulfilled 2000 plus years away. Now that's a huge red pill. That's something that just like people are just like, whoa, but what about this? And what about that? And how could that happen shortly? And, you know, and, and I'll, I'll get to as many of those things as I can, but I would refer you to some of the books, but um, so that's the first thing. These time texts in revelation are like two bookends, Dylan. The first verse tells you it's the content of revelation is going to be fulfilled shortly. And then revelation 20 verses six and seven verse 20 and uh, or verse 10 and verse 20 says, don't seal up the vision of the, of this prophecy for the time of fulfillment is at hand. And Jesus says, you know, surely I am coming soon. So when was the book of revelation written? Most people say, oh, well, in the 90s under Domitian. Well, the book of Revelation describes intense persecution of Christians, like real intense persecution of Christians. And we know, and even these same authors that will say it was written in the 90s, they admit that there was no widespread um, persecution of Christians during the reign of Domitian. But let's look at Nero. Nero persecuted the church from AD 64 to AD 68, three and a half years. And he, what he would do is his nickname was the beast. And he would light up Christians on the walls of his palace. And he would ride his chariot on the walls naked. He would molest uh, uh, boys, dress them in animal skins and, and rape them. He was called the beast. And he persecuted the church relentlessly. And in the book of Daniel, it does say that um, there will be this persecution that looks as if it's going to wipe out the church right before the end of the age. And that is what Nero was doing, basically. So we have this intense persecution in Revelation that fits the time of Nero, which would be writing the book of Revelation before AD 70. And that explains why John is saying the events are going to take place shortly well and so then the time can i interrupt you real quick here all in line with what we yeah yeah so nero's nickname is the beast i think this may be a opportune time let me know if you, you wanted to discuss it later to ask about the mark of the beast um absolutely let's go to that First of all, let me... i'm trying to get two screens at once and it's not going to let me do it so well just let me I'll know what verse that. you're on and i'll and i'll hop okay. to it sure Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to do a, a conflation of Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, because that's really where we get into the mark of the beast and who the beast is. So let me, let me get there. Let's go to, let's go to uh, Revelation 13 first. All right, so let me give you a broad, broad sweeping stroke here first, and just for those that are listening. When the book of Revelation talks about a sea beast and a land beast, 
And these two beasts come together and they persecute the church. All right. Along with the dragon. All right. And that's not China just because there's a dragon mentioned in the book of Revelation. I've seen some people do that. It's just bizarre. Anyway. And so the sea beast, the sea in scripture often represents the Gentiles. So the sea beast is Rome and the land beast is apostate Israel. And both of them come together and persecute the church. And, and Rome had this thing called emperor worship. And if you didn't acknowledge that the Caesar was the son of God, you could not buy or sell. And the Jews, if you became a Christian, they said, look, they would hold a funeral for you and said, you know, and we can't buy or sell to them. So Christians were very ostracized during this time. But as, as far as um, let's get into the first thing is it says in verse five, and the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. All right. Nero That's was specific. His nickname was the beast. Yes. He persecuted the church for exactly three and a half years between 80. Uh, 64 to 80, 68. Okay. Now let's go down to verse 16. And it causes all both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand and the forehead. Okay. So that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. Okay. So let's, let's stop there. Where is John getting this imagery? Well, if, you, if you're a Jew, you understand the imagery. In the Old Testament, God told Israel to put the law on your forehead and on your hand. Mm. Now, modern Jews, they put those, stu- those, put those stupid flackers, those stupid scripture boxes on their head, literally, and they walk around. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is, I want you to meditate on the word of God. I want you to meditate on my law. But I don't want it to stay there. I want it on your hand, which In symbolizes action. I want you to live it out. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Yes. Be a doer of be a doer of the word, not a hearer, not a thinker of it only. All right. So that's the symbolism that John is using. Now he's saying, don't take the mark of the beast on your forehead and on your hand, which means I'll give you an example of taking the mark of the beast. When Jesus was delivered up to Pilate, and he said, hey, I can give you Barabbas, or I can let Jesus go. Uh, and, and, he, and he said, this guy is saying that he's, he's your king. And what did they say? They said, we have no king but Caesar. Uh, they just took the mark of the beast. They mm. rejected their own king and took the mark of the beast. And so... What happened in the first century is, you know, if if you rejected that Jesus was Messiah and you rejected him over saying that that Caesar was your king, that was taking the mark of the beast. And which so, would allow you to buy and sell. Um, and I told you, you know, you exactly. Yeah, exactly. So let's go on with this. Uh, the six, six, six thing here. Um, let's go to verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, in the ancient world, they had things called cryptograms. And and, uh, in archaeology, we've seen some things where on their walls, we had like some graffiti with like the name of my beloved is 876. And they could calculate because their their numbering system was connected with their alphabet. Oh, he loves Mary. All Mm -hmm. right. And so this was a very common practice in the ancient world. So when you hear people today saying, um, oh, look, you know, these these vaccine, uh, these vaccine uh, uh, patents have six, six, six in them. See, it's the mark of the beast. It's like, man, stop it. (laughs) (laughs) it's got nothing to do with the mark of the beast and it's got nothing to do with 666 so nero caesar all right if you if you calculate in the hebrew the spelling in of 
of Nero Caesar in Hebrew, um, it, it comes out to 666. So Nero persecutes the church for three and a half years. His nickname is the beast. He does blasphemies, like I just, you know, raping kids and, and killing Christians. And his name calculates out to 666. And we know that, hey, Christians, you can't buy or sell unless you acknowledge that um, that the Caesar is the son of God. And they say, hey, wait, we have one son of God, and that's Christ. We have one king, and that's Christ. The apostate Jews, they rejected him, and they went with that system. They compromised. They took the mark of the beast. And so that's what Revelation is talking about. That's how these things are fulfilled shortly. They've got nothing to do with vaccine passports. They've got nothing to do with the new world order. Are these, are these systems evil? Yes. Can we make secondary applications? I mean, history repeats itself. There's always going to be wicked people, wicked systems that are going to try and enslave you economically. that are going to try and kill and persecute Christians. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a fulfillment of these verses. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And then I, I, was, I was thinking of bringing this up later, but I, I'll bring it up now because I think it's a great time to bring it up now. Because you did mention the patent for the vaccine passport or whatever the heck it was being 060606. I do remember that coming out and people going, oh, my God, here's the sign. Blah. Right. Well, if, right, right. If, if we look at this, this futurist or, or rapture club philosophy – theological interpretation and we say okay it's only 150 years old and we see the effects we talked about the effects which is don't do anything because you're about to be saved and or you're about to be you're already saved you're about to be raptured now if somebody is smart who is in the deep state of the new world order the illuminati or, or you know, whatever the heck the, these people are calling themselves and they say hey look at this interpretation of this religion that would otherwise stand in our way because what we're doing is evil and this interpretation actually gets them to stand down and do nothing. I wonder if we should promote this. Mm. Would would it, would it be that much of a, would it be a ridiculous idea to suggest that they might be thinking that way? Yeah. And I I wrote (laughs) in my book that is a concern for me. Yeah. And that is the new world order. Um, in their literature, they have talked about starting World War Three. I mean, we know they started World War One, World War Two. You know, these globalist bankers, the Rothschilds, which I get into in my book as well, they start these wars and they they loan money to these nations for the military equipment. And then when the wars decimate these countries and they've played both sides, the Rothschilds have funded two sides of different wars. And when the wars are done and the, and the nations are devastated, then they go back. They have to go back to these bankers. Buy everything up. Loans for, you know. These. Yep. Exactly. So they're the ones that are profiting. You know? And um, so the New World Order has talked about for a long time, starting World War III, between Islam and modern Israel. And I really think at some point they'll probably be able to pull it off because, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the show, each of these systems wants that war, right? So if I was the new world order, I'd be like, this is a no brainer. This is so easy to manipulate and start because these, these religions want this war. And what I show in my book is the battle of Armageddon was fulfilled in the Roman Jewish war, because why it says it talks about the nations of the world would, would surround Jerusalem. This is the battle of Armageddon, right? Now, we looked at Jesus's version of Armageddon, and we talked about how the Romans surround. But here's the thing, Dylan. The Romans, whenever they conquered a nation, they would take the best fighting men from those armies in that nation, and they would put it in their army. So when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem, it was representative of all the nations surrounding Jerusalem because their armies were encompassed the nations of that world. Mm -hmm. And so that's John's version of what Jesus is talking about in the Olivet Discourse. And of course, Revelation said it would take place shortly. In Revelation chapter 11, it says it it identifies this city, right? And it's, it's a city that is described as Egypt, Sodom, 
If you want to pull it up on your screen, I yeah, can't uh, see it. But, yeah, uh, I'm pulling it up. What, what verse are we in? Uh, Revelation 11, 8. 8. Okay. So it says, um, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that, that symbolically is called Sodom. It says symbolically, by the way. Symbolically, Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Now, this city where the Lord was crucified um authors have said well this is this is mecca authors have said oh no this is um this is the roman catholic church um no this is you know blah blah and on and on and on it goes but the text tells you it's where christ was crucified this is the judgment of old covenant jerusalem that we just saw was taking place in the olivet discourse Now, go back to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 11. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. That is three and a half years. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 100 uh, for 1,260 days, clothed in sap cloth. Okay, so this city is going to be tread down by the nations for three and a half years. In the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21, I think it's about verse 25, it talks about the Gentiles would tread down the city, all right? And, the, and it refers to that as um, the t- times of the gentiles is it coincidence dylan that rome tread down and attack jerusalem for three and a half years between 80 67 to 70 i don't think so i don't think so so here we have a city that's going to be judged for th- and be treaded down by the nations all right and the roman armies consisted of all the nations of the then known world for three and a half years and that's exactly what happened. I mean, this is, it's, it's beautiful. It's clear as day when you point it out. Of discourse in the book of Revelation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's awesome. So the book of Revelation is a tale between two cities and two women. All right. You have this, this wicked city that is called Babylon, the great city, Egypt, Sodom. And it says it's where the Lord was crucified. So it's old covenant Jerusalem. So what is John communicating? He's communicating You know all the enemies of God's people in the Old Testament? Well, Jerusalem, because it rejected their Messiah, killed their Messiah, and is persecuting God's people, they are now taking on the attributes of all of the wicked, uh, persecuting Old Testament nations. So John is just using allegorical, you know, rich language to say just how wicked Jerusalem has become. He's describing them with all of these you know, wicked nations that they would know, right? And in the Old Testament, the only uh, nation that is described as Sodom, other than Sodom, is Jerusalem. So we know that this great city in Revelation that's persecuting God's people and that would be judged in a three and a half year period is Jerusalem. In chapter 11, he connects the judgment of the dead as taking place when that city was judged. And that's exactly what Daniel chapter 12 does as well. It says, when the power of the holy people is completely shattered, all these things are going to be fulfilled. And he lists that three and a half year period too. Mm -hmm. So I know this is a a huge one for some people to to chew on, but because we're, we're, we're taught that, oh, well, when Jesus floats down on a physical cloud at the end of world history, all of these corpses, first of all, people are going to fly up into literal clouds. And people are going to fly up out of out of the graves, right? And that's that's the understanding of the resurrection. Many people do not know, and I, I get into this in my chapter on the resurrection in the book, that it was a Jewish belief <clears throat> that, now a lot of Jews did believe that. A lot of Jews did believe in a physical, biological resurrection. But a lot of other Jews said, no, the resurrection is when the souls, the dead souls or spirits of men that are waiting in Hades, for Abraham's bosom, when Messiah comes and finishes his work of atonement, 
They're going to be let out and raised out of Hades, either into God's presence or those souls are going to go to the lake of fire and be punished. I would submit to you that the New Testament understanding of the resurrection is that Jewish view and not the biological, because Paul says that the uh, the resurrection was about to take place in, in uh, Acts 24, verse 15. The Young's literal translation brings out mellow there. So, and in 1 Peter 4, 7, he says that the judgment of the living and the dead was at hand. Again, was Peter wrong? Was is, is John wrong here to connect the resurrection and the judgment of the dead? Well, if you have that physical concept of the resurrection and not this particular one, then yeah, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, you know, in revelation 20, he says that, that Hades emptied the dead. Uh, So Hades emptied the spirits that were there. The biological bodies weren't in Hades. Does it, do you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. I follow. It's, It's a resurrection from the realm of the dead of the spirits into either God's presence or the lake of fire. So, in a nutshell, I mean, that's what the Re- book of Revelation is. It's a tale of two cities. You have the apostate um, city that persecutes God's people. You have this woman who rides the beast, right? And she's a harlot. Well, that's Old Covenant Jerusalem. She was married to God, but she rejected the groom, and she committed apostasy, spiritual adultery, by by aligning itself with the beast with rome in rejecting messiah so she's become apostate she's become a harlot and then you have the contrast of this other woman the bride of christ right the new jerusalem and that's the church in hebrews chapter 12 it says that zion right is the church of the living god galatians 4 says that the jerusalem from above is the new covenant So in Revelation, at the end of Revelation, when you see this giant cubed city coming down out of heaven to earth, that's not the Borg. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's not a physical that's not a physical city that's someday going to come and land on the earth and make it so, you know, so it won't be able to rotate. Um, The reason that the city is a cube. Let me describe what this imagery is. The temple you had the holy place was like a rectangular rectangle. The most holy place was a perfect cube. And that's where God's presence was. All right. Resting over the ark. So in Ezekiel and the book of revelation, when it describes this city as a perfect cube, it's saying that that city is where God's presence is. That's the most holy place dwelling of God. And God says that we are the new Jerusalem. And so as Revelation ends, it says that the gates of the city are open and the spirit and the bride say, come, and the nations come into the city. So when I'm preaching the gospel and, and living water is coming out of me um, to other people, these are all symbols of unbelievers coming to faith in Christ through the means of the church preaching the gospel. But if you don't understand these symbols, if you don't understand the Old Testament and you literalize everything in this book, you're going to miss what these symbols represent and what John is really communicating. And and that's kind of what I'm up against, um, you know, when, when I debate some of these folks and uh, and teach preterism is I'm trying to get them to think biblically. I'm trying to get them to think, OK, Paul's using this symbol. Where in the Old Testament is it? You know, and then we have to go to the Old Testament. Okay, so now what is John communicating? And then we understand. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people just don't even take the time to do that because they want to talk about what's going on in the news and then shove it right there. It doesn't work that way. That's not how the book of Revelation was written. Right. No, this this is all entirely fascinating, and it's it's great to hear it from you. Um, It was it was good reading your book too, but to to hear it straight from you to to do it in real time, um, I'm learning a lot. So um, was there any more biblical verse for us to go over for your argument? I think we hit, we hit, hit, hit the main points, you know, um, there are different ways, just like with this generation, 
there are ways that people try and get around what the meaning of soon, quickly, at hand, about to, will not delay means. And none of them are, are uh, defended in the lexicons or the Greek dictionaries. Um, none of them make any sense. Uh, so, I mean, I wasn't going to get into a study of that, but I think your listeners kind of understand, okay, soon, quickly, at hand is referring to sure. something that was going to be filled in that contemporary generation. Sure. Yeah. And then I, I got but, a couple, you know, I get into that in my book. If you guys want to go into more depth, you know, well, what about the new heavens and the new earth? Uh, you know, what about when he says there's no more death? Um, how is that fulfilled today? Well, Jesus in the gospel of John said, if you believe in me, you will never die. Is Jesus saying that if you believe in him, you will never physically die? No, he's saying, if you believe in him, you will get eternal life. And when you do physically die, you're not just going to cease to exist. You're going to continue in God's presence forever. So in John, you know, when he's or in Revelation, when he says there will be no more death, again, he's talking about etern- receiving eternal life. So you're going to have questions about, well, what about Satan? What about, you know, Second Peter 3 with the dissolving of the heavens and the earth and the new creation? What about the resurrection? I want you to go into more depth on that. I want you to go into more in depth on First Thessalonians 4 and the rapture. All of that's in the book. All of those are dedicated chapters in the book. Um, so if you, you know, and again, that book is called um, Armageddon Deception, the Eschatology of Islam and Zionism, a biblical response. So because I, I know, I mean, when I when I came across this particular uh, view of Bible prophecy, so much of it was making sense. But I had so many questions as I just laid out. And slowly over time, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes just as much sense as time statements. And, you know, things just started clicking. So I, I don't have time to unpack all of that because I, I know what your listeners are thinking. Right. I know the questions. It's, it's what, what a, yeah, I got I a few of them right here that I wanted to ask. Or my website. Yeah. Well, um, that, um, well I'll, I'll, I'll keep those, those back because, yes, it, there's a lot of them to ask and they can go to the book or they can go to the website. What I wanted to get to was, uh, I guess, for, first important question. Is there any prophecy unfulfilled according to the New Testament or the Old? Okay, so let's let's go back to the Olive Discourse. Go to Luke 21, verse, I believe it's 22. Okay. What does Jesus say about what was going to be filled in his generation? He says, for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written, all that is written. What was written at that time? The New Testament hadn't been written. So he's saying the entire Old Testament would be fulfilled in his generation. So the Old Testament predicted the second coming. The, the Old Testament predicted the resurrection. The, the uh, Old Testament predicted the judgment of the dead. And the Old Testament predicted the passing away of the old creation and the arrival of the new creation. And John in Revelation says that those events would be fulfilled shortly. Jesus says all of the Old Testament would be fulfilled in his generation. So I would say he fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecy. Absolutely. What about, is there any New Testament prophecy yet to be fulfilled? What is... What is left is how the book of Revelation ends. And let's, let's go there. Revelation, after Christ has already come soon, all right, and all these events have been fulfilled, what does he say? Matthew, or I'm sorry, Revelation 22, verse 17. The spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, and the bride, that's the church, that's us, say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. So, okay, the question is, well, what now? If, if this has been fulfilled, what now? Okay, here it is. Number one, Bible prophecy is not about people flying up in clouds. Bible prophecy is not about people flying out of the graves. Bible prophecy is not about the earth burning on fire, all right? Bible prophecy from Genesis to Revelation is this. 
It's about a covenant relationship with God. God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat, you shall surely die. Did they die physically the day they ate? No. No. They died spiritually. They were now separated from God. Now, the entire biblical narrative from Genesis to Revelation is how God is going to restore that fellowship with man. And he does it through Christ, who is the tree of life. And he does it through his redemptive work through the cross and the parousia. And now he is restored. He's overcome that spiritual death. He's overcome that separation of sin because Christ has forgiven all the sin. And so that's what's exciting to me. I, I'm no longer excited about what's going on in Russia or China or thinking I'm going to fly off there. What I'm excited about is how God describes the church in Revelation where he says this perfect city has jewels and it's got gold and it's so beautiful. Why, Dylan, is he doing that? He's saying we have the righteousness of Christ. We're beautiful to him. And then to me, that is more exciting than all this other garbage that I see on, on TV being pawned off as Bible prophecy. So when you die, you either you don't go to a waiting place like they did in the Old Testament or prior to AD 70. You either go directly into God's presence or you go directly into the lake of fire. All right. So and and that's been fulfilled. And you are in God's presence. You have a spiritual body. Your spirit, your soul has a spiritual body. You enjoy God's presence forever. And to me, that's pretty exciting. And evangelism still takes place in the new creation. Uh, Revelation ends that way. Isaiah 65 and 66 talks about evangelism taking place in the new creation. And I get this question all the time. Well, uh, how can the... How can the uh, new creation be here number one if if there's all this evil in the world and blah 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 but look how revelation ends after christ has come the gates are open and there's evangelism taking place in the new creation so i asked him well if everything's perfect why is why is there evangelism taking mm -hmm. place in the new creation why are there sinners there all right and you go to isaiah 65 not only are there sinners in the new creation but there are people working and there's women given birth no, normal stuff so, is still happening obviously yeah the, right, right 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 so you know paul says that we are a new creation in christ and actually paul in uh was it second corinthians five seventeen, when he says you know behold all things are are gone and behold all things are new and you're a new creation he's actually citing the new creation of isaiah 65 and he's saying we are the new creation we are the new jerusalem and God's presence dwells in us. But we're thinking like, oh, it's got to be a globe and it's got to glow. And, you know, there's going to be this physical city. And no, man, it, again, you're not understanding those symbols and how they're used. You, you see what I'm saying? I see exactly and, and what you're saying. That's the problem. Our Western our Western mind just it doesn't think that way. Well, and, and it takes discipline. It takes I think one of the big things it does is that by leaving this open ended because because that this is what this is doing is it's it's the the rapture club view is stuff's going to happen and it's going to end and it's largely out of your control. The interpretation that you just given is all these things have happened. The covenant's been fulfilled. Now it's your responsibility. And exactly. that's terrifying, exactly. right? Because now it's like, oh my God, I'm the one <laughs> responsible here. And I I wanted to talk about responsibility. And but before, yeah. I mean, maybe leading into it, is you mentioned in one of your books, I can't remember which one, that I'm sure you mentioned this multiple times actually, is that these, these mega preachers, or they don't even have to be mega preachers, but to, preaching the rapture. And preaching um, blah, 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 blah. dispensationalism. There we go. <laughs> Remembering the right. word right. Um, will get you followers really fast. So I, I, I think I know the Absolutely. answer to this, but I, I want to hear your answer. Why will that give you followers fast? 
All right. I always equate this with climate change. All right. Has climate change made Al Gore a lot of money? Is the message of the the world is going to end every 10 to 12 years, the climate change gospel, does that get followers? Does that, it works. It works for the Democrat party. I don't understand how I don't, people can't think through it, but that fear mongering and that, that, that message that the world is going to end every 10 or 12 years just makes a crap load of money for these climate change folks. Now, in the world of religion and dispensationalism, Hal Lindsey is a multimillionaire. John Hagee is, is a multimillionaire. Um, these prophecy experts that read Matthew 24 and all they talk about is current events and Israel's getting ready to build a temple and blah, 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 blah. It's the fulfillment of this, that, and the other. They make a crap load of money because they're constantly manipulating people saying the end is near Buy my book, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll show you, you know, that the rapture is going to happen. I know I got it wrong five years ago. I know I got it wrong. That, you know, but I this time for sure. Books, and these people are still. Buying, yeah, but they're still buying their books. And, and they're still being they're still believing climate change, even though these guys are wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong. and wrong. It's like at some point you have to say there's something wrong with this paradigm. There's something wrong with this worldview. And these guys are getting rich off of my ignorance and my gullibility to do my own study. Because if I took the time to read the Old Testament, understand what these metaphors and these symbols are, then I could come to the correct conclusion. But I'm not. I'm lazy. And I'm going to listen to this guy on TV. And wow, yeah, the rapture's coming. So, you know, I guess we really shouldn't do anything about those globalists. Lazy. I guess we really shouldn't do anything about the New World Order. Lazy is the exact word that I wanted to jump off of here. So I would argue that this rapture interpretation is a drug. In the same way that you might take heroin, you being the general you, not you, Mike, please don't take heroin, (laughs) is um, drugs like that rob you of your soul because they make you a slave to the drug. Right, you, you're no longer allowed, no longer able to make free will decisions because all, all your existence is predicated on I need to get that drug, and in order to get off of that drug, I mean, first of all, there, there's the, the literal chemical withdrawals, and I'm not saying that's not a big issue, but there's another issue beyond that is if you get off that drug, that free will, theoret, you know, if, if you're not completely gone, that free will comes back to you, and then you become responsible for your ability to act again, and so that drug fends off the responsibility. Now, what's being sold with the Rapture Club theory is that, A, um, if you accept this, you get salvation, and you don't actually have to do anything to earn it once you accept it. Right? You you, you could be yeah. saved and do nothing. Yeah. Bam. And I see this as a, a massive drug where people get to say, look, I don't have to be responsible for my own actions in order to get saved. Sign me up. I'm in. Right. And when things get bad, I'm out of here. God's going to take me out of here. So I don't have to do any fighting. I don't have to get involved in politics. I don't have to get involved really in my family because things we're out of here. We're out of here. And and it just makes people irresponsible. And, and Jesus said in, in John uh, 17, he said, I pray father that you don't take them out of the world. It's, I mean, Jesus says, you know, we're in, we're in the world, but don't be of the world. And he says, I pray, Father, that you don't take them out of the world. So, you know, whatever First Thessalonians 4 is and, and one's understanding of that, it can't contradict what, you know, Jesus is praying. <laughs> right. God is never, God's never going to, you know, fly people off of the planet. That's, that's you know, beam me up, Scotty, is, is <laughs> not what... Uh, Paul's talking about. Well, and then this got me for a while, and I was thinking this before I even heard of of uh, preterism and and what you're teaching at all, is that if you have a Christian viewpoint, if you have a Christian faith, and you go into that Christian faith with an interpretation, and you come out of that Christian faith with an interpretation that says, I do not need to actively f- fight, see, um, blah, blah. I do not need to actively fight evil and actively work against Satan and actively do good things in the world, then you've messed up your math somewhere. 
Yeah, there's something right? wrong with the I, and, and, and I don't even think... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, uh, and I don't think it even requires a, a deep look into Scripture to figure that out. If you're going into Christianity and coming out going, well, I don't have to do anything good, then you messed up. And I I am so grateful right. of, of you really doing the deep dive, saying, yeah, you messed up, and here is actually connecting all the dots. That's, I mean, may, maybe somebody more uh, well-versed than me can might be able to find some inconsistency that, that you've, you've missed, but I haven't seen any inconsistency with what you presented. And, um, yeah, it's, you're being fed crap. That crap is likely being fed to you by the people who want to kill you. So stop eating it. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right, right. Yeah. It's kind of like these globalists, you know, they, the Walmarts, the Sam's clubs and, and all these corporations, we keep funding these people that want to kill us, that want to depopulate the earth that, you know, want to put all this crap in the food to poison us. And, and we listen to the CDC and, and Fauci and, and the guys, have you, have you gotten uh, Kennedy's book yet? The real Fauci? No, I got that ordered. I, I can't wait to read that. <laughs> I mean, Oh, man, when it comes to stuff like awesome. that, I, I feel like I do. I need any more details to know that the guy's evil. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, uh, that's true. But, I, I'm I'm a I'm a doc, I'm a documentation freak, so I, I like yeah. all the details. But um, yeah, so so don't fund don't fund these people that are going to harm you. And when it comes to these TV preachers that keep teaching the end is near, and that you know what's going on in modern day Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy. And I will be writing a series. You're on Gab, right? Of course. Okay. So if you go on Gab and you go down to the news on Gab, you'll see a series of articles that I've written on Matthew 24. And I'm also going to be doing a series of articles on the book of Revelation. And I've already submitted a series on Zionism. So I'm going to get into more of, you know, well, what do we do with modern Israel? Is modern Israel fulfillment of any kind of prophecy? Are those, what kind of Jews are they over there if they're not, you know, descendants of Abraham? So I get into all of that stuff. So that's another source that you can go to, go to Gab, go down the news, click the news icon and go down and you'll see that series. But um, so yeah, why fund these TV preachers when they're always wrong and they're always telling you, their theology at least is telling you not to get involved. They don't actively say, Hey, look, don't get involved in politics. They don't actively. Now some do, but they're, they're more consistent with their theology, but their theology gives you this impression that you're just really not supposed to do anything because everything is supposed to get bad. Right. And then I'm out of here. Well, and then it's even worse, right? It's not only are you not supposed to get, not only is it you're not supposed to do anything, you need to help make it worse in order to fulfill the prophecies. Here's the thing to end on, Dylan. If you're funding these TV preachers and they're supporting modern day Israel, you're supporting theft and killing. You know, Israel, the Rothschild, I call it the state of Rothschild, but modern Israel began by, by stealing land and killing even Palestinian Christians and Muslims. And so a lot of Christians think, oh, well, modern Israel and the Jews, they're God's people. So I need to give these TV preachers money so that they can give Israel money to rebuild the temple and so so that they can start a war with the Muslims and kill more people. So I can get raptured. Isn't that great? Because that's what needs to take place so I can rapture. That's blood money. Yeah. You're giving people money to steal land, to kill other Christians, and to create wars. Yep. If I shoot you, I'll be saved. I mean, the Old Testament, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 makes, it makes no sense. So people have to think about the consequences of their theology because there, there are really some great consequences for having bad eschatology. Indeed. Well, Mike? Um, I think we we covered it pretty well, so I'm I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, you're you're more than welcome to come on again. We can we can maybe dive into some more of those those details that you that you were uh, uh, alluding to. And was it was there yeah, any so final there. thing that you wanted to add before we, we we close up? No, you know, in the Book of Revelation, uh, Jesus is is called the faithful 
and true witness. So if we, if Jesus promised to return in a specific period in the lifetime of those standing next to him in their generation, soon quickly at hand, and we say, oh, no, I don't like that. I want him to come in my lifetime. So I'm going to change the meaning of all these words because I'm the most important person in world history, right? It's got to happen in my lifetime. What you're doing is you're adding to scripture and you're, you're twisting scripture to have it teach something that you want it to derive your theology from scripture and you'll be much more fulfilled because you'll see Christ in a much more beautiful light. Revelation means the unveiling of Christ and his bride. If you want to understand salvation and you want to understand how Christ has imputed his righteousness to you, then then read Revelation with this particular view. Now, if you're interested in other garbage, then go buy a Hal Lindsey book. And, and that's and that's your thing. But you're going to be wrong. You're going to be led astray constantly and constantly and constantly. And you're going to be disappointed. And that's another thing that that really hurts me is that you know these people they take their money their prophecies never come true and it just leaves people just totally disappointed and some people just like i don't even want anything to do with christianity because nothing ever happens Mm -hmm. and it's because they don't understand you know this particular position but so yeah i I want people to see christ and, and him lovely and and i think this particular view does that excellent Well, Michael Sullivan, thank you very much again for being on the show. And like I said, you're invited to come anytime. And this has been Dylan Lawrence Moore, your host at Irita TV, which you can find at irita.tv. And we will see you uh, also next time. Thank you. Thank you.